Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Lord of Talk is Mystery. This will be part 244. We're continuing <clears throat> with our lesson titled, The Inheritance of the Saint. This will be part 2. <clears throat> the scripture teaches, the born-again saint progresses into an inheritance that has two aspects one in the father the other in the son in Romans 8 16 to 17 <clears throat> as you're turning the Holy Spirit <clears throat> motivates the saint to understand that the more he pursues the knowledge of his inheritance <clears throat> the more prepared he will be to enjoy his inheritance when <clears throat> the time comes. Romans 8, 16 to 17. <clears throat> now we will find as we progress in these principles you may find some it's somewhat repetitive but this is the way I'm led to give it because it's needful for us to reach a stage of total comprehension so that we can apply in a total aspect what we are being given Amen <clears throat> For he will not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the Holy Spirit is our guide. He is <clears throat> our instructor. He is our source of comprehending all things spiritual, all things eternal. And the first thing that the scripture tells us is that he <clears throat> impresses upon us the fact that we are indeed sons of God. And that is the <clears throat> basic necessity so that we have a confidence to proceed in the things of God because we have the insurance <clears throat> that we are part of God and in that respect recipients of the things of God. So the Holy Spirit will always give us an assurance that indeed we do have the right to pursue these things. Verse 17, and of children and heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So the inheritance lies in a two-fold presentation. We have an inheritance in the Father as sons. Unconditional. We have an inheritance, <coughs> a joint inheritance with the Son <coughs> that is conditional. We come into it as a result of our being willing to experience his sufferings. Which brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches the inheritance of the father is an estate which he has prepared for his sons in the heavens. First Peter, first chapter, verse three to four. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So the Father has designed our <coughs> inheritance 
to commence at the time of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. At that, at that point, everything went into effect. All that the Father had prepared for his sons became the inheritance of his sons at the resurrection of the Lord. <clears throat> Two, an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. The inheritance is sure, it is everlasting, and we have a confidence that it will be there waiting for us when we enter into it. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Scripture indicates until the saint ascends to indwell his inheritance, it is in the care of angels. Angels are overseeing the estates of the sons until the son enters into possession of it. Does this imply that the estates require maintenance? Then they require administration. Explain, please. <clears throat> Organization. There are things that we're going to go into which deal with the estate's <clears throat> continued growth. It doesn't remain the same. It grows commensurate with the life that the saint lives on earth. And as it grows, it perfects. Yes. Is it full of life forms? Among other things. Hmm. Yes. Everything in heaven is an expression of life. Right. It lives. It's an expression <clears throat> which has <clears throat> certain similarities to estates on earth, and then it has deviate, it deviates into a great, greater states of perfection than anything you could achieve here on earth. If the ministering angels didn't minister, what would be the result? Uh, it would not exhibit a continued state of perfection. Would it be something akin to the first stringers? falling away from their first love. The estate? Yes. No, the estates are eternal. No, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the, whether it would be corrupted or not corrupted. Mm -hmm. I'm pointing out if these ministering angels didn't continue to maintain, mm -hmm. would it fall out of use, for example? No. Would it, would it decrease in some degree? No. No, because it says it's eternal, everlasting, mm. not subject to corruption or any deterioration. Okay. Yes. I believe... <clears throat> to add on what he just now said, they would be, if they directly decided not to do their jobs, they would set themselves up for judgment. But was that even possible with them being perfect beings in no. an incorrupted status? No. no. Yes. It's an impossibility in the primary creation. You mean impossibility to be corrupt in the primary creation? Yes. But they could choose if they wanted to, because they have a will to no. no longer do it. No, it's not possible, because you have to have an impetus to motivate. Okay, and it doesn't some exist in the right. prime. He had to create this for that right, type for of that. thing gotcha. to exist. Okay. Turn to Hebrews, first chapter, verse thirteen to fourteen. <clears throat> but to which of the angels said he at any time sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool are they not <clears throat> all ministering spirits sent forth sent forth from the presence of the father to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. It says minister for them. In other words, they're doing business for us at the direction of the Father. Yes. For what period of time do they, does his enemies remain to be his footstool? Until the end of the <clears throat> millennial state. The last enemy is death. Right. Then you go into the eternal state. Mm. 
So <clears throat> you have angels at this point overseeing many things dealing with the saint, the son of God, the born again saint who's progressing on the earth. Just picking up on the difference between the four and the two in uh, verse 14. Mm -hmm. Is the implication that those who minister for in the heavens, mm -hmm. the estate of the saint, mm -hmm. don't minister to the same saint who is on the earth whilst he's going through something, for yes. example? Yes. So who would do the ministering to the saint whilst he's going through something? Other if angels. Can you help us to understand the difference between these two groups? Turn to Psalms 91. Sorry. That's okay. No problem. We must know these things, Richard. <laughs> we must. There's so much to know. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we find that we've wasted so much time because it's been here all the time. Yes. Verse, Psalms 90, 91, verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, see they're ministering to the saint. Lest thou darest thy foot against the stone. So you have different groups, different assignments. Some are assigned in the heavens to <clears throat> administer in behalf of the saint okay. and others assigned to directly oversee the life of the saint mm. <clears throat> and this just basically can uh, involve angelic hierarchies sure. from the dawn stars all the way down to the regular messenger this is not something I believe would be mentioned in any Church, uh, church, let alone taught. <laughs> I don't think so. Praise the Lord. It's interesting. See, it, it just goes from one group to another group. One group is over another group, but it's, but it's necessary for them both to exist, for the, the groups to have their functions fulfilled, the responsibilities. And I'm reminded of the British Empire and all the various and sundry different components, which I have no idea about. I just know that they uh, they exist. You have a better idea than that than most of us here, mm -hmm. if not all of us. But it just it's astounding how it just keeps breaking off into and the, and these angels are over them. These angels are are meant to keep us in all of our ways. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that means. The, in the ways that we are going to learn about and then have access to and then become, you know, functioning in, they're going to keep us through all these. I just, you know, I see, I'm it's, just yammering. It's, it's interesting because that group who we see here in verse 11 to keep the all my ways, when the Father intervenes, which he does every now and then, yes. that's the group that he sends. I want this lady to become like this, 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 and this. Go and change her conditions. Go and let her know. No more. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So when we look at it from that perspective, this is incredible. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, well, it has to do with your origins in eternity. Hmm. That set the stage for everything you're going to ever experience in existence. Yes. So what's coming to me right now is that... <laughs> Blessed be he that forever praise his name. Is that he has put default angels in between us and, and our assignments. Because that's what he does. He can, he can just do all that to keep thee in all thy ways. Even though you're holy, you're sanctified, right. you're, a, you're a son of God. But he's, he's saying, look, you can't be trusted. Let me. <laughs> well, the word keep there basically means guard. Okay. Protect. Right, even from himself. I know that's true. Yeah. And it's also in circumstances. He'll intervene in circumstances that will protect you. Amen. I was told by my grandmother when I was real small, maybe about Mason's age, 
Something impelled her to go in the room where I was at. We lived on the fifth floor at that time. I was sitting in the window, fifth floor, my back to the window on the way out. She grabbed me by my feet. Otherwise, that would have been the end of it. That's an example of the angel sure. guarding you, changing sure. you. It didn't happen. It happened several times that way. I wish I got taken out. But the example is that you have angels operating in your best interest. Amen. But let's go on. Mm -hmm. Thank now we have a part in this. Scripture encourages the saint to enhance his estate by his labors on earth. Turn to Matthew 6 chapter verses 19 to 20. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, or in the heavens, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So he's telling us, this is the Holy Spirit again within us, gives us understanding to make comparisons of the things in the spiritual realm that you're encountering, that you're pursuing, you're engaged in, versus the things of the spiritual realm that you could do at the same time. Which one will you do? Jesus says, apply, pursue the spiritual so that you can maximize your inheritance in the heavens. Okay. Since the saint is maximizing his inheritance, mm -hmm. this may sound more human than it is meant to, is the implication that as his treasures in the heavens laid up grow, he requires more ministering angels. No, because the father from the beginning know, would know how okay. much assistance you're going to need. He's got all the bases covered. What he does basically is give us an understanding that if we're open to the Holy Spirit, how to maximize our time here. Make it work for you from an eternal perspective. And Jesus is talking about people that are going out pursuing earthly treasures at the expense that you only have a certain amount of time here you can do this or you can do that and he's saying the time you're spending pursuing earthly treasures that are only going to last a limited time and possibly you'll lose anyway because somebody is going to steal it or it'll be corrupted mm -hmm. take that time and invest it in building a spiritual treasure in the heavens by the things you are doing. That treasure never fades. That treasure is going to be maximized when you enter into enjoying it. Coming back to my previous question about the <coughs> number of angels ministering. Yes, of course, the Father knows. The point is, did he say he's assigning only one to this guy because that's the extent that he's going to increase his uh, estates, his treasures, and he wants 20 for this guy. Or does it take a number of them to do two different uh, a sizes? number of them. number of them. Because we have more than one, there's more than one activity that the angel is performing in our behalf. Okay. So it says, are they not all ministering spirits sent mm -hmm. forth to minister to them who are heirs? So you have numerous angels, just like you have numerous angels protecting you guarding you same thing numerous angels doing business for you of course in activities that from this perspective we can't gauge the totality of it okay but the father has all that covered from the inset now turn to colossians first chapter
Verse 12. giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. We've been crafted, designed for life in heaven where our inheritance is. Our inheritance, everything that we will ever experience when we leave this reality is going to be in terms of light. Right. Now, what does that mean? That means as you mature, your light intensity increases. Mm -hmm. The higher you develop, the more illumination you manifest and the greater intensity you manifest. So in that respect, the Father's designed all of us to function at a rate that he has designed us to function at, some more than others. When you enter into your estate, it's going to be light. Mm -hmm. Your treasures are going to be emanations of light. Uh, beautiful, glorious, radiant. Turn to Daniel. Just before we go to Daniel. Yeah. Do you describe the emanation of the glory of the saint whilst he is on the planet? We're not talking about at the point that he's been glorified whilst he's on the planet. Mm. He is emanating some form of light. Sure. Is that true? Sure. Do, you, do you call that, at that stage, glory? Or can it only be called glory once the glorification is No, happened? you can call it glory. The glory levels. Okay. Paul talks about we traverse from glory to glory. Okay. So as soon as you're born again, you have a glory. Gotcha. Daniel, 12th chapter... We're going to see this aspect of being designed to focus and uh, emanate light levels. Verse 3. <clears throat> They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. They're going to have the brightest glory of all the sons of God. Mm. <clears throat> Why? Because they have been designed to emanate wisdom. The Father's wisdom. Then it goes on. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So they have been designed to emanate a glory but it's going to be a lesser intensity <clears throat> because that's what the fathers designed them to be mm -hmm. Paul talks about till we reach the fullness of the stature of the measure of Jesus Christ each one is designed to maximize uh, to progress to his maximum uh, state of creation mm -hmm. creation what he was you know it's like the, 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 the craftsman that molds the cup this dish, the bowl, whatever it is, it's a size, it has a dimension, it has been crafted for a capacity to contain right. a certain amount. Same thing with the sons of God. So looking at the wise here, should we understand that since the Protodicus elders themselves become wise at the end of the gathering, mm -hmm. are they part of this wise that we see here? Meaning teachers and elders? No, just teachers. The, uh, <clears throat> the elders would be more in the, the second group. But not necessarily. Yes, you're gonna you're going to have a class, a family within a family. The wise are going to be the teachers. Agreed. The elders are the students of the teachers. The point I'm bringing out is, it's possible for someone who is not an elder to turn many to righteousness. Sure, <laughs> definitely. But what you're finding here is there are some who are created to do only okay. that. Okay. As 
compared to the one who's created to manifest that plus wisdom in all aspects. He's going to be the great, have the greatest glory. Sure. <clears throat> it's just like in the angelic hierarchy, the dawn stars are designed to emanate a glory that the archangels aren't designed sure. to emanate. So it's however the fathers designed it. <clears throat> Let's go on. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> scripture indicates the Father has designed the new creation for ascension into the heavens as part of his inheritance. 2 Corinthians 5th chapter, verse 1 to 8. Now, as you're turning, <clears throat> what Paul is doing is giving us a picture of the working on the inside of the born-again saint. He's giving us a picture of the desire of the born-again saint. And in other passages, he's giving us the desire of the saint that's walking in the flesh, not in the spirit. His desires are different than the saint that's walking in the spirit. The overall impulse of the saint that's walking in the spirit lines up with this description. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So he's giving us a description of the composite picture of the saint once he leaves the earth. He's going to have a celestial body, a glorified body designed for life in the heavens where he will ascend to await the descent back with the Lord for the glorification <clears throat> of his total being. While he's here, verse 2, for in this we groan, earnestly designed to be called upon with a house which is from heaven. The Holy Spirit will give you insight <clears throat> into what's waiting for you in the heavens. And when that illumination is realized, you will desire to participate in what you have been created to experience. That's normal and natural. A child born on earth has desires which manifest that are designed for him to experience things on earth. Mason likes to play with his little games. Mason likes to play baseball. Mason has desires to enjoy his little life that he's got here on earth. It's normal and natural. Yes. I suppose it's going to be both ways, but I'm thinking, are we going to visualize or visually see something that we have not yet partaken of and by doing that it increases the desire or will we just develop into the experience of acquiring what we see <clears throat> the spirit gives us understanding through two things perception and understanding so you're going to perceive things on the inside you're going to develop that perception into understanding. And when you achieve understanding, then you can appropriate that as an experience. This is what Paul is talking about. He says, well, we know. Well, we perceive that when we pass from this point, we're going to have something waiting for us. That perception nurtured becomes understanding. I know. Later on in verse 87, I have a confidence that I can experience that. It started as a perception. We allow it to nurture within us. The Holy Spirit makes it more and more understandable. The problem that we have is a lot of times it's not allowed to develop because it comes in conflict with the carnal desire. 
which overrides it, neutralizes it. So it's not allowed to develop to a point of understanding. Mm. You try to, uh, case in point, you try to explain something to another Christian who's not on your level, he's going to pour cold water on it because number one, he's looking at it from a carnal perspective. Number two, he's not going to allow you to develop it to a point where you can even explain it because it's not real to him, therefore it can't be. Yes, sir. It gives me great pleasure and joy, Mr. Jones, to know that even you are going to experience that per that growth. That oh, See, you, sure. you keep answering every question that is brought to your attention, and so you know you're you're the end all, you're the be all, you you are doing it all. But there's even a little surprise in there for you. <laughs> was, Quite a lot. That blows my mind. Quite a lot. <laughs> and I'm so thankful. <laughs> Quite uh, a lot. But let's go on. <laughs> Verse 4. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, be burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now Paul is putting his finger on the problem. The problem is that there's a struggle between the new creation and the old Adamic nature. The new creation is miserable in this body of corruption. It wants to live in the conditions for which it was created. Yes. So again, I'm going to answer my own question. So there must be degrees of dying to self. Yes. yes. When can we just complete it? <laughs> <laughs> It's a staged progression. We set the sta we set the stage uh, how fast we want to do it by the decisions that we make yeah. to make the transition from spiritual to total spiritual. By welcoming in those experiences. Yeah, uh, by cultivating the desire within you. When you begin to feel something within you. Immediately, it's going, you know, every action is an equal and opposite reaction. Your carnal is going to fight it. We have to develop the, the, the ability to take the carnal by the throat and neutralize it so we can allow it to become stronger and stronger. Amen. So, this is what Paul is talking about. Yes. So, I'm at a, at a stage where I realize that, um, you know, I must suffer and I have to. Uh, endure hardship and this and that and the other. Um, admittedly, I'm not enjoying that part of my growth. And so, but at the same time, it's necessary. The Father has made it part of all of our understanding that that's what's going to happen. So I can speak all this, so I'm, I'm accepting it of it all I want, but I'm, you know, I'm not desirous of undergoing a bunch of suffering. But it is necessary to embrace it because that's where the growth comes from. So, <laughs> can you tell me how to uh, completely and totally die to self? For every positive, for every negative, there's a positive. When we learn to see what the carnal tells you is negative, or what the spiritual tells you is positive, then you're allowing the spiritual desire to overwhelm a carnal interpretation of what you're experiencing. The scripture talks about Jesus, how he looked at the cross. If you knew you had to die within a three year period, the average, from a human perspective, the average person would look at that from a state of agony, of um, remorse. Yeah. Because he would look at the suffering, he would look at the egregious things that were waiting for him, which Jesus knew all about. But it says he looked at that same experience with joy. Why? He could see the positive and the negative. We train ourselves <clears throat> to look at the positive in every negative experience we have. And what we are doing is freeing ourselves from the restraints of a situation. You're allowing the spiritual. The spirit never, never, never sees things from a negative perspective. Mm. The carnal does. In that respect, 
it <clears throat> merits a discipline on the part of the individual. It's part of our growth. Somebody persecutes you, calls your name. Well, the carnal response is to respond in likewise. The spiritual is that you read the Sermon on the Mount where it says, when they persecute you, rejoice. Because you go, you got a reward coming in heaven for that. Yes. The scripture says, when we are weak, that's when we are strong. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. Okay. So remind me of that, that scripture, guys. We can see life from one of two perspectives. We can see our life from one of two perspectives. I see Christians, and it, it breaks my heart because I see them living in a limitation in which they're repeating the same experience over and over and over and over again. They're not benefiting from the experience, they're just experiencing it. They're not in, in, embracing understanding of what they're going through. They're not embracing uh, advancing in any degree, because number one, they're not taught. They don't have the ability to discern the physical from the spiritual, and they're just increasing that. And <clears throat> When you try to explain that to the person, you get no receptivity because they're programmed to reject a spiritual observation of life. But the individual that pursues an understanding and allows his own spiritual comprehension, perception, understanding, to dominate his life walks free. He becomes the overcomer. He enters into a situation where, yes, it's challenging, yes, it's not pleasant, not at all, but he is strengthened in it to endure it, overcome it, and benefit from it. And that impels him to continue on and on. That's the way Jesus lived his life. Praise the Lord. That's the way we're expected to live. You know, Jesus did all the heavy lifting for us. Mm. Paul talked about from my light affliction. And when you look at the things that man went through, you you, you, you just shake your head. <laughs> the stuff we're going through isn't even comparable. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. <clears throat>